Hello, everyone. We are a week away from the NHL draft, and here at Lockdown Canadians, we have a very special episode with a very knowledgeable guest. Yes, we're still debating Shane Wright versus Yaroslav Kofsky. We're going to talk first-round value picks, second-round value picks, and who could be boom or bust for the Montreal Canadiens. For Locked On Canadiens, your daily podcast on the Montreal Canadiens, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hello, everyone, and welcome to episode 647 of Locked On Canadians. Thank you, as always, for making us your first listen of the day. If you're listening wherever you get your podcast, if you're watching, you will already know what's happening. We have a very special guest today, and before I introduce him, he has been long requested on this show, and we are finally able to track him down uh, after he finished all of his work over for Elite Prospects on their draft guide, available now. You should go buy it, 900-plus pages of content. I am joined by the active stick, Laura Saba. And Laura, I don't mean to cut off your intro. We have so much to get through, and I will allow you to ask the first question when we get there. But first, I have to introduce our guest. He is a former co-worker of mine at Habs Eyes on the Prize, and he currently works for Elite Prospects. He is David St. Louis, at David ST underscore Louis on Twitter. I got it right. I believe I pronounced everything correctly until I am told otherwise. Uh, David, thank you so much for joining us today. You have been one of our most sought after guests and we are so very excited to have you here. Yeah, it's a real pleasure. I'm really happy to be here. I don't do a lot of podcasts, but I think it's going to be really interesting. (laughs) (laughs) Well, Laura, uh, as we continue the, the discourse, (laughs) as we are calling it right now, do you want to ask, uh, David, our first question here in that? We continue the right Slavkovsky debate. <laughs> so the floor is yours because if I go on about this, I'm going to get banned from Twitter, YouTube, and wherever else we host this podcast at this point. Yeah, please don't get fired. I don't want to do this podcast with anyone else. Uh, <laughs> Debbie, first of all, thank you so much. You are one of the most requested guests. We're not lying about that part. Like so many people have wanted you on. And here's the thing. I'm sick of it. Scott is sick of it. And then we, yesterday, what, what we're recording this yesterday, Bob McKenzie came out with his his uh, list and on the top, he had Slavkovsky, he said by a hair. And we just texted each other and we said, oh no, because this is just going to reignite the debate. How sick are you of this conversation, right versus Slavkovsky? Yeah, I'm a bit sick, honestly. <laughs> uh, the, the Twitter is just this debate. Like every time I go on, I, I want to respond to everyone, but I just stopped doing that because I, I've said my, my piece. For me, it's really Shane Wright. But yeah, so Bob McKinsey's ranking came out and it's, of course, now Slavkowski. So the debate is really, it's, it's kind of, it came back again. So now <laughs> really at e side, what we see of them both is that Shane Wright He's not necessarily the best player this season. Like I, I get that U.S. Slavkovsky had his bigger moments. He was better on the World Championship chip stage. He was better at the Olympics. Um, but Shane Wright, I think in five years, if, is going to be the better player. And it's really what matters. I was reading about, McKin- about McKinsey's article, and really they talk about Shane Wright's performance this season. He wasn't as hard on the puck. He wasn't. He doesn't. Didn't have the same passion for scoring that they said, but. To me, that matters a bit, but I like to project more in this. So I'm interested in what happens in five years. And I think when we look at the full picture, Shane Wright has a better chance of becoming the better player. I think he will fit in more formations too. He's going to be able to play center next to all sorts of winger, while Slavkowski will be... We have to have the right teammates alongside him to really perform in the NHL. And what I like... I really enjoy players who have great off ball games, who like to, who know how to position themselves offensively, who find space and connect plays and are able to support teammates very well. And I think Shane Wright does this better than Slavkowski. Slavkowski has the handling skills, the physical skills, he has the Netron game, and those are greater than Shane Wright. But Shane Wright also has a better playmaking game and he has a better defensive game in terms of projection. Sure, the effort wasn't always there when he was FG on the back check sometimes. We saw many clips of that on Twitter. 
but <laughs> I, I don't think uh, <laughs> you know what I'm referring to. I don't think that matters. <laughs> Everybody that knows. Much. Everybody who's a Habs fan knows what we're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> and we have to understand that the roles of the four check. Like, if you're F1 on a four check and you have to come back with intensity, if you're F2 and F3 more into the back, it's okay to glide because if you're if you, your team has even numbers on defense and they get a quick turnover, then you get the puck up ice and. So, uh, and Shane Wright is really smart about anticipating a game and knowing where to be at the right time. And the reason he sometimes glides on, on the back check like this is because he's looking for offensive opportunities and he doesn't want to over back check either. So I think his understanding of the game is better than Slavkovsky. And it's really what made us rank him ahead at the EP rank side. I think one of the things is that people think that when we say that we would prefer as Habs fans, we, we would prefer that Shane Wright is the choice. People think that we're speaking negatively or slamming Slavkovsky. And I don't think that's it. I think that he's a player of immense talent. I think he's so fun to watch. I just think that when you're trying to build a team almost from scratch, right? Like we're going to talk in another episode with, with David about the Canadians' current uh like prospect pool and things like that, you're basically building from the ground up. So for me, when you're in that situation, you always pick the center over the winger and you always take the guy who can, exactly as you said, anticipate multiple moves ahead. And the thing that I'm curious about is that, you know, you followed this for a long time. This is your job. This is your expertise. Like, were there question marks like this? And I know he's he, he was drafted much later, but were there question marks like this about Nick Suzuki's game? I remember the first couple of games he played, even in Montreal, people were questioning his commitment, his intensity. And the more he plays, the more I realize it's his brain, right? So do you think like that's the kind of criticism that he had as well? Yes, exactly. And have Spen should have been prepared for a debate like this because it's exactly the same thing that happened with Nick Suzuki. And we saw it especially when he played at the World Junior Championship under 20 uh, in his second year. I know he was there just one time, I think. And he was not very visible in that tournament. But if you looked for him, he was doing all of the right things. And I made a video a while back on this and he had some amazing flashes of hockey sense, of anticipation, of being in the right place. And the this facet of the game still shine even at the tournament when he wasn't super involved in a lot of plays but he also didn't play on the top six line and he wouldn't he featured on the second power play i think so he didn't get the opportunities to really show his talent and i think it's the same thing with shane Wright to an extent like if we look at uh, slavkovsky at the world championship he was playing 20 minutes a night he was next to nhl players and he was playing some weaker formations that aren't that good at defense, even if they're professional players. So he was set up for success. And Shane Wright in his organization, junior organization, Kingston, he played a kind of a football-like type of game where they relied a lot on they relied a lot on short passes to move the puck up ice. And I think he wasn't not that he wasn't allowed to show his talent, but Shane Wright is someone who likes to play according to the system and he likes the details of the game. He's the captain, he leads by example. So he's going to fit into the system and apply it like to its details. And th th that's how he plays the game. So he's not flashy. Sometimes if you think he lacks space, it's just because he positions himself at the, at the right place. And it was the same debate with Nick Suzuki. And I remember typing on Twitter, responding to a lot of people about Nick Suzuki saying the same exact things. They're a bit different players in some respects, but the base of their game, it's really the same. So if you doubted Nick Suzuki before, you shouldn't doubt Shane Wright for the same reasons, because they're not the same player, but they can follow the same development path. Context matters a lot when it comes to yes. this. As to kind of put a bow on the segment here is that people talk about Slavkovsky's, you know, world championships where he played Italy, France, and Kazakhstan. All due respect to those countries, and you know, they are professional players in various leagues. It's Italy, France, and Kazakhstan. Kazakhstan being the top out of there and them managing to come within four or five goals of teams that, you know, world championships is considered a success. But we're going to push that to the side here because if we do any more right Slavkovsky debating, my head is going to explode on this podcast and nobody wants to clean that up. We're going to shift focus here to the end of round one and the beginning of round two where the Montreal Canadiens have a pair of picks. We're going to ask David for some of his, uh, his sleepers or favorites there. But first... Today's episode is brought to you by betonline.net, and they're your number one source for all your sports betting needs and info. Get all the latest developments on things like NBA free agency, the upcoming NHL draft, Major League Baseball is in full swing, and you can also get things like MMA, boxing, and golf 
all your favorite sports, all your news, all your information, all your new lines, all in one place. So head to betonline.net or use your mobile device to learn more about the trends and the action. Bet online, where the game starts. And before we jump right into our next segment here with David, we have to remind you that Locked on Canadians, we are your first listener of the day, but please, please keep your eyes peeled next week. When we get into full draft coverage, we're going to have reactions to the picks. There's going to be the live show. There's going to be so much. So subscribe to Locked on Canadians. Stay tuned here on YouTube and check out Locked on NHL. We're going to have you covered on everything. We're going to jump into it, though, because we have so many more questions, and I'm going to jump right into it. Assuming the Montreal Canadiens do not trade up from 26th overall or whatever they do, they're going to turn Josh Anderson into the second overall pick, and I'm going to become a leprechaun with a pot of gold. Hoi, 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 hoi. If you are the Montreal Canadiens, David, and at the end of round one there, 26th overall, there could be a number of defensemen left. There could be other centers left. There could be wingers left. We know there will be goalies left unless something strange has completely happened. Who is your, you know, value pick that's kind of settling in that 26 to 33 range there that you think the Canadians could get a lot of value out of there and maybe surprise some teams with how well they do in this draft? I think um, a player like Noah Oslem could be there. He's ranked pretty high on some list, but I know many NHL scouts have concerns about him. He's a bit lighter and he's a player who plays more on the periphery and I think NHL teams tend to stay away from those players a bit earlier in the first round but he's pretty dynamic he's a really good rusher he can uh, trace a trace a path to a path through the neutral zone he can beat defenders one-on-one and he's a pretty good playmaker too and just like we talked about uh, with Shane Wright he's really good at supporting his defenseman he's a natural center he understands the position he positions himself well and he can distribute the puck very well too so, so I think there's a lot of upside with Noah Oslin. And there are other players who might fall. Like uh, I know Yurov might be a bit optim- optimistic, but we, don't, we never know with the uh, Russian factor. He could be maybe not 26, but if the Habs want to trade up just slightly, he could be there. And he's a really he's a forward who has a lot of skills, but can also play a sound defensive game. And he can beat opponents one-on-one, but he can also safeguard his own team. He's pretty aware too. So that might be a really, really nice uh, pick. He might might take a bit of time for him to come over, but when he does, it's going to be really worth it. And there are a bunch of defensemen who have a, who have a quite high upside, like Sam Rinzel, who played in the high school system in the U.S. for most of the season. He's a six foot four defenseman, or six foot five, I think, who skates really well. And just from those two attributes, uh, really <laughs> above average size and above average skating ability, it's already very interesting. The issues are decision making because he's not used to a high pace of the game. And even when he played in the US- USHL, he felt a bit overwhelmed, I think, at times. But with those physical attributes and his handling skills, he's a raw package that he could end up like a top four, top, top pairing defenseman in the end with the right development and a lot of guidance and video work and all of that. And if I can name one last player, I think uh, there's a German guy. Julian Lutz, who played very well at the end of the season, I think he's going to go around that range. Um, he's a high-paced guy who plays, who has a high skating ability too. It's really high hand, and he can. He's a great playmaker. He can also apply a lot of pressure on the forecheck. So he has a physical games, but also uh, a playmaking game. And those two combine, I think he projects very well to the NHL. Like other German players, he reminds me of the player that Buffalo drafted uh, a year ago. <laughs> I forgot his name, but he was another German forward who supported the play well. He had playmaking skills and, and a lot of pressure games. So those Sounds are some like names, I think. JJ to me. Yeah, wow. thank you. I don't know why I know, because I had to watch him play the Rocket throughout the playoffs, and I'm like, this kid's a yeah. nightmare. Um, yeah, it, it's, it's a similar a, type of game. Yeah, and the thing about the end of the first round is, if you're the Canadians, and Laura and I did an episode on this, if you're picking Shane Wright, the world is kind of your oyster at the end of round one. If you want to get another center, like an Owen Beck, who may not have the highest ceiling, but the floor is there, you can do that. If you pick Slavkovsky, you're kind of shoehorning yourself into, well, we have to get a center because the Canadians, you know, need that. They are lacking down the middle as it stands right now. Nick Suzuki's great. Christian Dvorak is fine for what he is, but Jake Evans and Ryan Paling are what they are. They're missing that next step there. And, Shane Wright allows them the flexibility. And I think that's so important 
it, we had this debate in the eyes on the prize slack last night. It's like, okay, do they take a defenseman, someone like an Owen Pickering who was available in the mock draft? Do you take an Owen Beck? Um, do you take like a Jagger Furcus who could be there at the end of round one? We're going to talk risks in our last segment here, but I feel like the flexibility there, it, it makes 26 a lot less scary knowing, assuming they pick Shane Ryder, they pick Slavkovsky, every team knows they're going to be picking a center and is going to offer them every crappy trade package in the world to try and move up. And that scares me a little bit. If, if they do end up having to pick a center though, besides you know some of the names you mentioned is there anyone else that really sticks out as like hey if you need a center this is should be that guy if you didn't pick Shane Wright this is the closest you're going to get to that at 26th overall yes and you, you named him it's really Owen Beck for me he's Shane Wright like they have the same kind of play style honestly if they do end up going with Slavkowski and they get Slavkowski and back I think it's a pretty great draft anyway because Beck might not have the same upside, but I don't think his production really reflected how good he is actually on the ice. Like he's super mature, mature player already in the OHL this season. He his defensive game is really advanced. He's super aware. He understands his assignment, and he can switch rapidly from one assignment to the next. And he he has some playmaking flashes too. Like he he had some. It's against production. It wasn't super good, but he at time managed to really beat defenders one on one and manipulate them. So he would deceive them and make, make them move one way, and he would go the other way or create a passing lane to a teammate. And he was he had some great flashes that suggest a lot higher upside than uh, his point total might suggest. But it's really his pressure game, his physical skills, and his ability in transition to just distribute the puck to teammates. He's really. Uh, sound sound uh the defensive player and he's a really has a really mature game that projects very well to the nhl he could play in the nhl in like two years in a third line role maybe second line role that the, the issue is really is is ceiling right you said it and there's noah austin that i really talked about i think he's another good target at center because i think he's going to remain a center really his game fits more in the middle of the ice than in the wing and there's nathan gaucher too who I think he's more of a winger than a center, but he played center this season. And he also has a defensive game and the physical skills and the net front game. So they have other options. It's just that there won't be a first line upside kind of guy later in the first round. It, it feels like they're, it's not the end of the world. Like Laura and I both said, if they pick Slavkovsky, we're trusting their judgment on what else they're going to do. We both feel we value that flexibility that if they take him first overall, they can do so much more with this draft because they're that team that comes in like in the NFL draft and it says team needs and it just says everything like outside of like maybe wingers. I think they're pretty well covered on stuff. So we're going to transition a little bit further from there. We're going to go from all these guys are underrated and could be a steal to player haters ball here in a second. So <laughs> we're going to, we're going to talk um, some of the people that are high risk could be high reward or could, you know, blow up in your face. And that's all coming up next. All right, we are back uh, with David St. Louis of EP Ringside Elite Prospects, one of the scouts, one of our most requested guests. And as I mentioned at the end of last segment, the people want to know if you are Kent Hughes and Jeff Gordon and you are approaching 26th overall and there's names on the board that you look at, who are some of those names that stick out that go, you go, this could be the biggest deal of the draft or they could be playing in the Czech extra Liga within three years of being drafted because it didn't work out. It happens to every team. This is not a Canadians only thing, but sometimes it doesn't work out. Who are those big high risk guys on I don't want to say your board person because I don't want to put you on the spot like that, but some of the guys that you think kind of fit that mold that, you know, it could be a huge bust if things go poorly. Yeah, it, it sounds like you're talking about Philip Mishar, <laughs> who I'm not sure it's going to be a Canadian pick if I look at their history. At the same time, they just changed management, so maybe. Uh, but he's really a high risk, uh, high upside kind of guy. He's really fast. He's another transition player who can be defenders one on one in, in the neutral zone. And he's another playmaker, too. The issue is that he doesn't have a physical game. Like, it's very hard for him to stay anywhere inside on the ice in between the dots because he gets moved super easily by defenders, especially in front of the net. 
the way he approaches the game instead is that he's, he times himself inside pockets of space. So he avoids getting checked because he arrives in an area at the same time as the puck. So he's really smart, but you can't only rely on that unless it's super advanced, like a Cole Caulfield who does that super, super well, like at an elite level. That you can survive, but Philip Machar is going to need to develop uh, his strength, but also his physical skills and his ability to bounce off of opponents. Um, so he's a bet you, you take on skating and agility and one-on-one -on -one ability and also an off-puck game that's really developed. By off-puck, I mean the timing that I just talked about. Uh, but yeah, he could be playing the, the extra Liga in a, in a few years. That That seems likely to I just um, want all fans yeah. of the Extra Liga, if you're angry at what Scott <laughs> and David said, please direct your anger to Scott and David and leave me out of it. <laughs> also, if I, I love the Czech Extra Liga because one year Amir Jager is still playing there. Thomas Placanis is part of that. I will accept free jerseys and swag in terms for saying nice things about look, I am shameless. Everyone here knows that. I am a sucker for free things. So um I wear at least a size 52 in jerseys and Back to the point that we were making here in a second. <laughs> the draft is all about risk, right? If you don't take risks, you you miss out on trying to on landing the big fish. You know, we've seen teams take a reach. Kel McCarr was considered a reach at the time. And guess what? He turned out to be probably the best player and one of the best players in that draft class when a lot of people thought it was a reach. A lot of people thought, you know, Jesse Pugliarvi sliding down was a bad thing and Maybe not. It's if you don't take risks, you don't get the chance of that. But at the same time, if you're the Canadians, how much risk do you want to take when you have so much in this draft tied up for a rebuild? You have 14 picks. Admittedly, they'll probably trade some of those. But do you just go for this guy projects as middle six? This guy projects as middle six. This guy's going to be a bottom pairing defenseman with a lower floor that they're guaranteed to make. Or if you're Jeff Gordon, do you step in and kind of go, and Kent Hughes, to that regard, and go, we're going to swing for the fences, and we're going to go for it. Uh, like, I wrote Philip Mishar's profile for Eyes on the Prize today. I wrote Seamus Casey's profile earlier this week. And there are guys that I look at this and go, if it pays off, it, it's great. And I know I've talked to you about Seamus Casey and Philip Mishar in, in the Slack channel a little bit. Do you think the risk is worth it even if they fall somewhere between what their ceiling is and what their floor was, or is there some, would you err on the side of this guy is, you know, a guaranteed bet at this, but that ceiling is not as high. Yeah. They have two picks that are pretty close together. The one on 26 and 33. So I would probably go high upside for one and one guy that's more safe because they also need to some depth. And just because a player projects as middle six, doesn't mean that he can't develop further than that too. Um, like a player like Nathan Gaucher, who, yeah, he might be a, a third liner, but he also has passing ability and playmaking skills too that could develop even further and push him to toward the top of your lineup. So, yes, they are high upside, high risk guys, but you can't really discard the other safer picks because they don't have upside. Because if you develop them right, I think they just have, they could have just as many upside, just as much upside as someone like Philip Michar. But there are some pretty fun picks that you could make in this range. Like Jaeger Firkus, I'm pretty sure he's going to be available at 26. He's like 149 pounds, I think, right now, five foot nine. Uh, so he really needs to bulk up. That's really, really small. But he's one of the better shooters in the draft. Actually, we ranked him as the best shooters in the draft. Should be the best shooter in the draft. He's very good at leveraging his small weight to. <laughs> launch box to our net so he, he has really the, the technique down um and i think with more weight and a, a little bit more speed he's, he could really explode and become a top line forward even because he has not just a shot but the playmaking skills and the one-on-one -on -one ability and the elusiveness to an extent like his skating is not amazing but it projects as slightly above average and with his hockey sense he could play even uh, as a slightly above average skater mm -hmm. and someone who's on the lighter side uh, for an NHL player and there's other, there are other picks that you can make, Russians, like Gleb uh, Trikozov, that I don't like as much as draft Twitter in general, but he has a <laughs> high level of skill um, in his hands and in his feet. He's, he's, not, uh, he's a playmaker, first and foremost, but he can score too. And he's a bit physical too. He has a greedy side to his game too. And he makes some amazing passes through defensive layers, like through three or 
or four, even four defenders sometimes. Other times, his decisions aren't as great. So we have some hockey sense concerns sometimes, but he flashes like he's a really intelligent player other games. So high risk because if he doesn't end up um, playing in a top six, top six role, he probably won't be playing in the NHL. And there's another one, yeah. last one, Viktor Nyuchev, who are a bit similar. He has a lot of skill, like handling, and uh, he, is this, his playmaking is really deceptive. But again, is he going to come over soon with the Russian factor? So these are the names you could really bet on uh, around this range. And we have so much more with David uh, going into tomorrow's episode. We're going to cut this one off here because we have so much more to talk about in our next one. We're going to talk the current Canadians prospect pool, how that impacts their draft and so much other stuff. And if you want to follow David, he's on Twitter at David S T underscore St. Louis. You can find his work over EP ringside. Uh, the elite prospects guide is available now. I cannot recommend it enough. It is a godsend on draft day for when your team picks a guy that you've never heard of and you need to write a profile on him. They have you covered because they have watched this guy play at least several games at that point. As always, you can follow us on Twitter at LO underscore Canadians. You can follow Laura at the active stick myself at Scott Matla subscribe on YouTube. We're closing in on 1300 subscribers and that's going to go up. You're not going to want to miss all of our draft coverage coming up, and we will see you all next time.